Hello and welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at WAB org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore ampersand books. I'll put the links in the chat. And I'll also mention that it's uh, available for curbside pickup at our location as well. We're so excited to have Elizabeth Miki Brina with us today. First, we'll hear her read. Then she'll be in conversation with Ali Myers Oki. Allie Myers Oki is an emerging fiction writer based in Oakland, California. She is a queer cis woman with ancestors from Japan, France, and the Eastern European Jewish diaspora. She's currently working on a young adult novel based on her grandparents' experience in the Japanese American internment camps. The author M. O. Walsh has called Speak Okinawa the rarest of books, as expansive as a history propulsive as a novel and intimate as a confession. It reads like a great consciousness springing to life. This book is more than an eye-popping debut, more than an introduction of a hugely talented writer. It is a time machine, love letter, a revelation, a triumph. Elizabeth Miki Brina is the recipient of the Rona Jaffe Breadloaf Scholarship and a New York State Summer Writers Institute Scholarship. Speak Okinawa is her debut memoir. She currently lives and teaches in New Orleans. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay. And, uh, okay. We're excited to hear. Uh, thank you. you thank you. All right, I'll get started. Um, well, uh, um, my book's called uh, uh, Speak Okinawa, um, and uh, it's called uh, Speak Okinawa because Okinawa is where uh, my mother was uh, born and raised, and she lived there until she uh, met my father, who was a soldier stationed on the island after he served uh, uh, two tours of duty in Vietnam. Um, and I usually read from the first chapter because it requires the least introduction. But since this is a, a Rochester-based event, I wanted to read a chapter that takes place uh, in my hometown of Fairport. Um, and uh, there is a lot of uh, joy um, from uh, my childhood and from growing up in Fairport, but uh, unfortunately gets left out here. Um, and I guess I did that because I wanted to show, uh, you know, what happens to families, particularly my family, um, when um, they're, you know, they've originated uh, from war and imperialism, uh, when half of them is displaced, and um, when, uh, you know, I didn't, when the child, when I, uh, I didn't know um, anything about my history or my heritage or um, uh, what, who my mother was uh, until I started writing this book, which was six years ago now uh, at the age of 34. Uh, so I'll begin reading. It's called uh, 1%. I am five years old. I am sitting in the front part of a big truck in between my father, who is driving, and my mother, who leans her head against the window. We are moving to a new town, a new state. My father has found a better job, a better place for us to live. He loves the future. He craves newness and possibility and adventure. He is happy. He is always happy when he is taking care of his family. So he drives. 
My mother has no choice but to follow him. She already made her choice when she married him. She doesn't love the future. She accepts it. She has moved from Okinawa to the United States as his wife, the wife of a soldier. She has moved from Manhattan to Phoenix, to Chicago, to Plainsboro, New Jersey, following his jobs, his dreams. She knows she can't go back to her poor island, her poor family. She is not happy, but maybe she is more relieved than resigned. So she leans her head against the window. And I don't mind in the slightest, staring out the windshield at my old house, my old neighbors who are waving goodbye as we pull out of the driveway and turn around. Past and future have no meaning for me. I don't know what it means to miss a place. I just wanna be wherever my father is. Now I live in Fairport. My father has chosen Fairport because it boasts the finest public school district in the Western region of New York State. Well, second best after Pittsburgh, the neighboring district, but he can't afford for us to live there. At least he hopes, not yet. My father owns a business, a chain of video stores called Chose to Go. During the weekends, I make sure the cassette tapes are inside the right covers. My father pays me $3 a day until I can save $100 and then I buy a bicycle, which costs much more than $100. During the weekends, I watch movies all day. In the office or on the big TV in front of the store. One of my favorite movies is Karate Kid 2, which takes place in Okinawa. I know my mother is from Okinawa, but that doesn't make sense to me. Okinawa is a piece of fiction, as foreign and exotic to me as it is to any other five-year-old kid growing up in the United States. My mother is from Okinawa, but when I have questions about their strange practices, like catching flies with chopsticks, I ask my father, who is the smartest person in the world because he is from Manhattan. I watch the dancing and tea ceremonies with fascination, but I feel no pride, no connection. Mr. Miyagi is also a piece of fiction, a character, a caricature. He is like Yoda, like a doll. He talks funny, like my mother. Fairport has a population of roughly 6,000 people, 99% white and 1% everything else. The only other Asians I know work at Fujia, the restaurant where my mother works as a waitress, owned and managed by a Chinese couple, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, staffed by more Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and a couple Okinawans who work the dining service, as well as Vietnamese, Cambodian, Thai, who work the kitchen service. I can't tell the difference between them. Here in the United States, Asians are all the same. The details of our histories, languages, and cultures are negligible. Here in Fairport in 1986, Asians, Blacks, Latinos, part Asian, part Black, part Latino are all the same. We are simply not white. I don't understand, and I won't, not for a very long time, why I will try to stay as far away from the rest of the 1% as possible. For much of my life, I won't want to be associated or too visible. During the week after school, I sit at a table at the restaurant and roll towels, which will be heated in a big rice cooker. And I feed the koi fish and fetch pennies from a slate rock fountain plugged into the wall. I watch the waitresses wrap themselves in kimonos and tie their sashes in elaborate knots. They speak to each other in languages I can't understand. And when they speak to me, they talk funny. Sometimes I still can't understand. After my father closes the store, he picks me up from the restaurant. He takes me to McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, Pizza Hut, or Boston Market for dinner. We watch the news for a while and then nick at night together. We watch Bewitched, Mr. Ed, My Three Sons, and then The Patty Duke Show. Sometimes I stay up late enough for Donna Reed, but that's my least favorite. We laugh, and when I don't laugh, he explains the jokes. By the time my mother comes home from the restaurant, I'm already asleep. Sometimes I pretend to be asleep. Sometimes my mother drives me 20 minutes to Penfield, another suburb of Rochester, to visit the dishwasher's daughter. She is Vietnamese. She thinks and speaks in Vietnamese. I think and speak in English. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do together, except sing karaoke. I sing Whitney Houston, and she sings songs I've never heard before. I sing in English. She sings in Vietnamese. She makes me uncomfortable because I see the ways we resemble each other, and I find her quite ugly. She has short hair. She has short black hair, a flat face, and slits for eyes. She wears glasses. Her clothes are cheap. She lives in the Pines, an apartment complex where poor people live. I hate how her apartment smells, like fish. Sometimes my mother drives me 30 minutes to Aronicoit, another suburb of Rochester, to visit the waitress's daughter. Her mother is also Okinawan. Her father is also white. She also thinks and speaks in English, but she doesn't look like she thinks and speaks in English. She is a half-breed, a Twinkie, just like me. 
When I come over, all I want to do is hang out in her basement. We watch Parent Trap twice, play 50 rounds of Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt, eat a large cheese pizza and two bags of Doritos. We leave grease and powdered cheese on the controllers. We are fat. We are gross. I don't understand why my mother wants me to spend so much time with these people. I don't want to understand what we have in common. My father tells me that at school, I will finally make friends, but instead I'm hardly noticed. Except sometimes some of my classmates stretch their eyelids with their fingertips and sing the song, We Are Siamese from the Disney movie, Lady and the Tramp. Sometimes they call me Data, the booty trap setter from the Donner Spielberg movie, The Goonies. Sometimes they call me Tinkerbell because of my slanted eyes or Miss Piggy because of my pug nose. I don't understand that these names they call me are racist. I am not yet aware of the damage this daily teasing will cause. It seems harmless. Lots of other kids who are uglier and poorer, many of them happen to be my fellow 1%, get teased just as much, if not more than me. For much of my life, I will feel like I have no right to complain because being ignored and belittled isn't so bad. I am not feared or hated or oppressed. I start to drop things a lot. I can't open the tiny cartons without spilling milk all over my desk. I can't carry the lunch trays without splattering food all over the cafeteria floor. As punishment, my teacher says I must stand at the sink to drink my milk or at the trash can to eat my lunch. For the rest of the week, I become known as the girl who is clumsy, and this pleases me, because I am known for something that is cross-cultural, non-restrictive. I start to drop more things. I knock over chairs and bookshelves. I make myself trip and fall. Kids laugh, teachers yell, and this pleases me. I relish the attention. Very often in the movies, kids who get laughed at or yelled at turn out okay in the end. When my mother looks at me, she sees her daughter. She sees the part of me that is like her, the part of me that is Okinawan. My hair, my eyes, my nose, my lips, my skin tone, my reserved and deferential temperament. She sees the onigiri, ramen, and miso soup she feeds me every day, unique family recipes I can't help but find delicious. She sees the time I got sick with pneumonia and had to be taken to the hospital, but the doctors were too slow and indifferent, so she fed me a stew of seaweed, green tea, and herbs until I'm cured. She sees the time Oba carried me on her back, how natural and at ease I looked, pointing and just starting to mumble words in her language. It does not call her, cause her shame or aversion or confusion to see me this way, because I still come from the same place as her. She just wants to be close. She just wants to be home. She doesn't understand, and I don't either. I won't, not for a long time, why I feel so different from her, why I want so desperately to be so different from people like her. When my father sees me, he sees his daughter. He sees the part of me that is like him, the part of me that is my, that, the part of me that is the mind he is trying to shape. My imagination, my proneness to daydreaming. He sees the books he reads to me every day, Peter Pan, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Grimm's Fairy Tales, and The Little Mermaid. He sees the time he took me to a showing of Fantasia at the theater, and I was so exhilarated, so grateful, as if he had taken me on a hot air balloon ride. He sees the time he played Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata on the record player, and I lay down on the floor so he could get my head so I could get my head closer to the speaker. It causes him pride and adoration and reassurance to see me this way, because race and ethnicity are incidental, external peculiarities that I can transcend, that he will help me transcend. He will help me be like him, a cultivated American. He will protect me, prevent me from becoming more like her, an outcast, an interloper. He doesn't understand, and I don't either. I won't, not for a long time. How his rearing of me will complicate how I see myself, how I see my mother, and distance me further from her. On Saturday and Sunday mornings, after cartoons, before we go to work at the video store, my father and I make pancakes from scratch, because that is what his father made with him when he was a child. We make a dozen pancakes. My mother sleeps while we make breakfast. She shuffles into the kitchen while we set the table. My father pulls out a chair and kisses her on top of her head. I'm glad you came to join us, he says. Sometimes my mother smiles and sometimes she squints and stares ahead. Would you like one pancake or two, he asks. Sometimes she says one and sometimes she groans. Okay, we'll start you off with just one, he says. He sits down a plate and a cup of coffee. Here you are, my dear. He addresses us both as my dear, and sometimes this makes me jealous. She wraps her palms around the cup, warming herself with the steam, letting my father be the pleasant one, the gracious one. I kneel and wriggle in my chair, waiting for my plate, 
looking at my father, asking my father for three pancakes, not looking at my mother, not asking her how she slept, how she feels, how was work last night, not wondering how many days have accumulated before she let herself give up and just hushed. We spread butter and pour maple syrup. My mother is exhausted or hungover and she barely eats more than a few bites. I prefer to lick the batter from the bowl and I barely eat more than a few bites. My father eats six pancakes by himself and throws the rest out. He doesn't mind. When we don't have to work at the video store, my father and I spend our weekends at the YMCA in Pittsburgh. He drives us 20 minutes along the Erie Canal. We catch glimpses of brown water through the trees and talk about what time of year the locks will open or shut. We listen to the radio and talk about the songs we recognize. I can remember the titles and the artists who sing them now and my father is very impressed. We park in the parking lot outside a big brick building with a neon Y sign. We check in at the front desk and are greeted by our names, Mr. Rena and Elizabeth, father and daughter, because we come here almost every weekend. He goes upstairs to run on the treadmill and lift weights. I stay downstairs and go to gymnastics class. I learn cartwheels, then back walkovers, then back handsprings, then I learn how to do each move on the balance beam. Halfway through class, my father walks through the door and stands against the wall. I wave, he waves. He is the only father who watches, the only father who cares. At first, the coaches and classmates ask, is he your father? And I say, yes. At first, I don't notice their expression and then I will not understand what it means. And then some of my coaches and classmates will ask, are you adopted? And I will say no. And then they will pause for a moment to figure out what to ask next. I start going to gymnastics class every day after school. My mother drives me 20 minutes out of her way on her way to work. She drives while I nap. She drops me off at the curb. She doesn't check in at the front desk and isn't greeted by her name. Halfway through class, she doesn't walk through the door and stand against the wall. She doesn't watch. I don't mind. I am seven years old. For Christmas that year, instead of visiting my grandparents in Manhattan, we have to stay in Fairport because my father has to work. I'm mad I won't get to cross the George Washington Bridge, which is my favorite part of the trip, or see the big tree in Rockefeller Center, or eat linguine with clam sauce and struffoli. I let them know I'm mad. I know exactly what I'm doing. My mother takes me shopping. I pick out three dresses and three Barbie dolls. Now I have 40. We wrap the gifts together, even though I already know what they are. My mother takes me shopping for my father. We pick out three ties and a wallet. On the night of Christmas Eve, I look beneath the tree at all the presents, six for me, four for my father. Does mom have any gifts? I ask my father as if they would magically appear, as if by Santa Claus. He shakes his head. I didn't have time, sweetheart. We'll get her something after. Part of me thinks that's okay because my mother never really cared much for Christmas. Another part of me knows that's not right. I know that everyone is supposed to get something on Christmas, not after. So I gather my crayons, I'm going to write, I love you, on a piece of pink construction paper. But somehow an ingenious idea occurs to me and I decide I'm going to write, I love you, in Japanese. I ask my mother, how do you say I love you in Japanese? She smiles and says, Watashi wa anata o aishitemasu. I ask her to write the phrase on a post-it note. I carefully copy the hiragana on a piece of pink construction paper, but the lines are all jagged then cut out and glue a big red misshapen heart. On Christmas morning, when we sit around the flashing tree to open our presents, I wait until the end of the very brief event, event to give my mother the gift. I can't decipher her face. It tenses and twists like she is about to cry. I look at the three dresses, the three Barbie dolls, the three ties and the wallet. We should have bought her something. Later that evening, I steal the gift, which she has tucked into the top corner of the mirror on our bureau. I tear the gift into pieces and throw the pieces into the garbage. When my mother sees what I've done, she covers her face with her hands and weeps. Why, she asks me. Because the gift looks bad, makes me look bad, and it belongs in the garbage. I'm sorry, mom. I promise I'll make you a better one. With glitter and paint, with the lines curved correctly, with a perfectly shaped heart. But I don't. I never will. I am nine years old. My father's stores have gone out of business. Now we have to move to. He considers Manhattan, but he can't afford to live in the nice parts and send me to a fine private school like where he went without borrowing money from his parents, which they gladly would have loaned. My father is a man, a strong man. He's a rugged individualist, words he spews at the talk show hosts. He can do everything by himself. 
Besides, my mother and I aren't too keen on the idea either. She has her job at the restaurant, and I have a vengeful desire to belong right here in Fairport. So we move into an apartment complex, not as bad as the Pines, but still an apartment complex. I finally make friends though. Their names are Tiffany, Megan, and Shannon. They're poor, white trash, I hear people say. Their parents are divorced, but they're pretty, blonde haired, blue eyed, fair skinned, and freckled, and they want to hang out with me. Sometimes they call me Tinkerbell, sometimes they call me Miss Piggy. I am so happy about having friends that I don't care how badly they treat me. I don't care that we go on dates with the new kids on the block. I must be paired with Danny, who looks like a rat, so they say, even though Jonathan, the second ugliest, so they say, is totally available. I don't care that one time they steal three large vases of coins from my mother, coins she has saved from years of waitressing tips, and blows it all in games at a carnival. I don't care that another time they steal a diamond necklace, the diamond necklace my father bought for her, the only diamond necklace he ever bought for her, from my mother's jewelry box or that they steal cash from her secret wallet in the first drawer of the china cabinet. I don't care because I've only learned that people like me, and especially people like my mother, aren't important. When I'm in fifth grade, a black kid moves to our town from Houston. Now we have three. All of our think friends think we would make the cutest couple. On a Saturday, on the playground in the fields behind our school, they demand that we kiss. I close my eyes, I lunge forward, but that's a mistake, because girls are supposed to stand still. I bash his teeth with my teeth and bust his lip with my braces. They laugh at us. He dumps me the next day. In middle school, the names get worse. Sometimes they call me Chink or Gook, and when I tell them I'm not Chinese or Korean, they call me Jap, as well as a more original yet terribly uncovered pejorative gorilla woman because of my flat face, pug nose, and thick eyebrows. They tear pictures of gorillas, chimpanzees, and monkeys from magazines and shove them into my desk and locker. This is the year 1992. This is before the obligatory people of color are exposed to mainstream America through Gap and T-Mobile ads. I guess I look strange, unfamiliar. I guess the way I look makes them uncomfortable. We are still extras, one-dimensional villains and sidekicks. But I don't know if anything can account for how cruel I am to my mother. I ignore her as much as I can, disregard her as much as I can. I rushed off to bed before she comes home from the restaurant. I pretend to be asleep. I don't want to eat the beautiful meals she spends all day preparing when she doesn't have to work. I mock her pronunciation behind her back. I roll my eyes and snicker to myself when she can't read the basic instructions on a shipping label at the post office. I cut up a bunch of her clothes, dresses and kimonos she has stashed in boxes. I cut them up because they're hers. I cut them up because I need them to sew patches onto my jeans and jackets. I don't bother to ask permission. I mean, she never wears those dresses and kimonos anyway. Sometimes she gets so frustrated at not knowing the words that she hits me. She slaps me across the face or smacks me on the head repeatedly or pulls my hair so hard that part of my scalp forms a tiny bump and throbs afterwards. Sometimes my father has to yank her off of me. I never hit her back though, not because she is my mother and I respect her, but the exact opposite. She is weak. She is a weak woman who talks funny and looks strange and cooks strange food no one else eats. And she gets drunk mostly on her days off. She never drinks when she is alone with me, but when she starts, she can't stop. She drinks sake and wine, and when the sake and wine run out, she switches to bourbon, which is my father's booze of choice. Sometimes my father has to block her from the front door. She charges and crashes into a stout pillar of a body, trying to escape. Then he wrestles and restrains her, pins her to the floor until she punches, kicks, wriggles free, and then she starts charging again. She wants to go back to Okinawa, she screams, but she is shit-faced and barefoot and wearing only a nightgown. Sometimes he has to drag her to the bedroom by her armpits, legs kicking and flailing, screaming, and then he tosses her, gently of course, onto the bed. She is tired but belligerent, crawling to the edge of the bed, trying to escape again. My father waits at the edge, ready to block her, ready to grab her and toss her, gently of course, back down onto the bed. He stands guard for the rest of the night, with one, put, with one foot propped on the edge of the bed and one elbow propped on his knee, assuring me with a smile that she will feel better in the morning. We stand guard and watch her together, making sure she doesn't leave, because even though I don't want her to be my mother, I don't want her to leave. We stand guard and watch her together until she whimpers herself to sleep. I wish I had crawled into bed with her, told her not to worry, told her that I am her daughter, I am home. 
I wish I had been on her side as she was always on mine. But I was a little girl then and more than a little scared and selfish and I didn't want to be near her. Sometimes I wonder how different our lives might have been if we had lived in Manhattan, even the not so nice parts, even Brooklyn or Queens or the Bronx, if we had lived in Seattle or San Francisco. Or what if I grew up now? Is the world kinder, better now, or am I just older? Then there's a picture of my, me and my parents <laughs> at the end of the chapter. So I thought I'd show that. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was beautiful. It was, it's cool to think of you reading for location. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, uh, I got some of the, 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 the driving times wrong. I'm sure people are like, wait, Penfield's not that far away from Fairport. <laughs> so, but it felt like a long time to me when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I just, in the spirit of decolonization, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I just to acknowledge that I'm, uh, uh, speaking from Oakland, which is unceded Ohlone land. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. Um, but my first question is, um, I feel, I felt it when you were reading and I felt it when I was reading to myself <laughs> um, that while the book is a memoir, the rhythm felt very poetic to me. Um, very musical, almost in a certain way. Um, and I feel like that has to do with a few things like the, the chapter titles, the way the paragraphs are, are broken up. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I was curious how you approach the rhythm of the book and if music plays a role at all in your writing process. Oh, wow. I've never been asked that question before. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I definitely, I write for the sound, you know, I, I always, uh, I, you know, everything I write, I read back to myself. Um, uh, and I want it, I want it to sound pleasing. Uh, I mean, especially since the, it's, it's kind of part of the, the healing, I think too, is because like a, a lot of it is so hard and sad that almost to make it, you know, to make it sound uh, rhythmic, it's like almost like it helps get it out of you, you know, uh, um, and it helps. Uh, and it, you, you can take these pa painful moments and, and then um, make them sound nice. <laughs> it's, it, it's it almost like it redeems it, right? And you, if you can, if you can capture it in such a way uh, that it, uh, um, it becomes its own object, right? And that, uh, that, that you can look at and hear um, and I, and I think also too, um, like even with the, like the history parts, uh, and, and, and my childhood, um, you know, especially with the history, uh, that, you know, because I didn't know it, um, for so long, right. I was, uh, 34 years old before I knew Okinawan history, which is insane, right. Uh, that I wanted to, I don't know, I, I wanted to be able to, uh, it, it, it became sort of like a mythology to me, like telling, telling my own, telling my own history and telling my own, uh, childhood in a way, uh, that was, um, that I, that I could make sense of. And then also like that could, that could be like, um, uh, a story that I could live in. And that was, uh, um, and so, you know, uh, redeemed, right? Uh, um, because it had been, uh, because it had been hidden from me for for so long. So I think the the, the musical part uh, is part of that too. Just um, like w wanting to, wanting to tell myself a story, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That that makes a lot of sense to me. I feel like the history chapters almost felt like a chorus like mm -hmm. we have you know 
like a verse of your life um, and then kind of a chorus of the, the Okinawan history. And we'd kind of know, we'd get used to, <laughs> we the readers, uh, we'd get used to knowing that that was coming and um, comforting as a reader kind of in the way that music is that way where like the verse takes you somewhere but you know you're going um somewhere that repeats uh yeah very cool um speaking of the history chapters uh you know a theme that caught me about the book a lot is is belonging right um feeling and finding like searching for a sense of belonging and also just moments where you're you know, the posture feelings come in and um, the, that recurring theme made the choice of the, the we, like the, the first person plural in those history chapters, especially powerful. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that choice. The using mm. Yeah, that was, um, uh, yeah, it, it it took a it took a while to to, to come to that. Uh, I mean, I really uh, so I you know I I, uh, I sort of I delved into this research. I um, uh, I knew that I needed to incorporate the history um, because that's uh, you know so much of my, of my story, so much of why my mother is the way that she is, and then um, how she arrived to me as her, and then you know, then how I, uh, um, how, how I uh, inhabited the world, and the world inhabited me. Uh, so I knew that the history had to be part of it, uh, and but I didn't know how I'm gonna, <laughs> right? Because um, uh, in most of what I read was um, like academic texts or uh, um, sociological texts, uh, and. I read um, uh, a lot of memoirs, um, and I, I, I was just like, "How do I make this sound close? Right? How do I make it? How do I make it sound intimate? Like, because it, it's uh, as if it's really a part of me." Um, and uh, that was that was very important. I was like, "I need to make this sound personal." And then I came across. Um, I was. It was just so, so lucky to have read this book, um, The Buddha in the Attic. Have you ever read it? No. Really. Oh my goodness. It's devastating. It's uh, a, <laughs> um, uh, um, Julia Tsuka. Uh, and, and she, so I, uh, so I stole her idea, um, <laughs> but <laughs> she writes in first person plural mm -hmm. and uh, it's about these, um, uh, they're the, the mail order brides and it starts on their, their boat ride. Um, they're, they're, they're married to Japanese immigrant farmers in San Francisco, mm -hmm. actually, um, uh, and around San Francisco. Yeah, and she, <laughs> what, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, I mean, this book is just like definitely one of my favorite books I've ever read. Um, and, and so it tracks their, their lives from the, the boats to arriving in San Francisco. Uh, um, and then it ends with the internment camps. So you would, um, uh, I think, yeah, <laughs> the Buddha in the attic. Um, and, and she writes it all in first person plural. And I, I just thought, I was like, finally, yes, this is it. This is how I'm gonna do it. This is how I'm gonna do it. Uh, but I think it really, it really made sense. It gave me, um, like it was, it, it was it allowed me to access these events in history that um, that I you know I never witnessed uh, um, or experienced, but that they're still a part of me, and um, so um, so that was really important. That the that the ownership of it, uh, we we we, and especially especially since I had uh, denied it for so long, I tr you know I tried so hard to just reject that part of my. Um, background part of my his my identity uh that um yeah saying it uh saying as we too is like a way for me to 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 claim it like this is mine too uh, this is me too so yeah yeah absolutely I, I I felt that that claiming and um I think it was nice in reading some of the 
like like the difficult chapters, like the one that you read, knowing that that was coming was like it was nice. <laughs> like uh, feeling interlaced already um, before we got there narratively, and that was um, really beautifully done. So. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it felt actually felt really good to me too to write. Um, uh, even though the, you know the the history is also really um, uh, painful and um, really you know uh, uh, challenging to encounter, but it, it it felt good to be um, I guess not necessarily outside of myself, but uh, um, you know because it because it is still me, it's part of me, but like just feel good to like uh, um, not be so focused on myself right it, that that this that this is not just about me right it's a um, it's a collective so uh, um, and and the, and the, and again I don't uh, it's I'd like to say that I had it all planned out and I was like, you know, mastermind the structure. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's it, a lot of it was just inspired and in how um, the way things came together as I was writing it. But then uh, as it was coming together, I'm like, oh, that works because right. Like the, uh, you know, past and present are, are constantly in conversation and, uh, and influencing each other. Like, you know forever and ever. <laughs> um, yeah, I just see a question um, from Aunt Allison uh, in the chat um, saying, Elizabeth, can you speak about your process before you embarked on the actual writing of your manuscript, even as early as teenage years? How did this prepare you to commit words to the page? Mm. <laughs> um that's funny uh, it's a uh I uh um I was just thinking about my teenage years and um especially since I, you know uh I just read a chapter about uh, uh growing in Fairport I um well I was I'm an only child so you know I'm you know very very introverted and um yeah, you know, oh, I'd always done lots of, lots of things on my own, lots of quiet time, but I didn't really start writing until um, like maybe twelve or thirteen, and and it's funny because I really wanted to be, uh, I really wanted to be a singer in a band, like that was like my my, I remember I remember the switch, <laughs> because I was like I want to be the lead singer of a punk rock band. Uh, and then, but I was like, I can never do this. I was like, I, for some reason, I, I had already decided. I'm like, that will never happen to me. I can never do it. Uh, so the next best thing is writing, <laughs> um, uh, which is just, yeah, even, even at, at that age, so young, I was already so defeated <laughs> um, with this, with this number one dream. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, it's, it's a story that's been I think definitely building in me for, for a really long time. Uh, uh, I avoided it for, for so long. I, uh, I didn't want to think about it. I, uh, um, I tried to write things, uh, you know, I always said like, I, I tried to write what was universal. Right. And, and that's the thing about writing too, is that when you try to be universal, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, because because I'm always, you know, because if you escape your own humanity, right, like you escape what makes you human, uh, the particulars or what makes you human, just like it, all, all, everything that is unique to you uh, and everything that's unique to you is right. Uh, uh, um, uh, <laughs> what, yeah, exactly. Right. Is what makes it relatable. So um it, it took a very long time, honestly, until uh, my first, it was, um, I had, uh, uh, even when I was taking writing seriously and I joined a, um, a creative writing program, uh, I was getting my MFA, still would not write about, would not write about my um, mother, 
would not write about my Asian-ness, uh, um, co constantly avoided it. I was just writing about uh, what everyone writes about at first, drugs and breakups. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, and the very, it was, it was after, um, and I write about it in the book too. Um, it was right after I had gone to my mother's baptism and uh, she had just joined this uh, uh, church as a, um, a Rochester Japanese Christian congregation. That's what they were called then, but I think they changed their name now. Uh, but it was this, uh, um, it was almost about 50 members, uh, almost all women, uh, almost all, uh, they're all Japanese. Um, and uh, almost all of them were my mother's age. And, and everyone who was a, um, a woman who was my mother's age was married to a, um, uh, a, a U.S. soldier, a man, a, a, a man who had served in the military. And I, you know, that kind of just blew my mind uh, to see that because I always thought that I was, I, I, you know, I thought my family was so strange. It's just a very isolated incident. Uh, and then to, to see this connection. So I, uh, um, I, I started to write, I tried to write an essay just about the baptism and uh, everything, you know, and then I realized to, to capture that epiphany, that moment of shock so much, right? Like I had to uh, go, go way back in time and I'd talk about all my, uh, you know, my childhood and then the history of what brought these men and women together. Uh, so I just started growing and growing and I, and I wrote maybe like a very rough sketch of it uh, for, for my workshop. And it was, everyone was like, this is, this is the good stuff, <laughs> you know, like this. And I was like, really, you guys want to write like, you know, like this, <laughs> I was, I was very surprised. I thought like, no one wants to read about my mother and my like, you know, uh, um, uh, tumultuous childhood. Uh, but yeah, that's what I, that they, it really caught on in my, and it was my uh, professor actually who wrote on the top of it, the, the essay was, uh, you know, this is your book. Um, so which is, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank him for that. Uh, so, oh, wow, we're all already done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Jan says, um, well, I'll, well, I just wanted to say quickly that I was trying to figure out some kind of question about punk because I feel the punk of your book and <laughs> I think you just kind of covered it. Like, oh, cool. I don't have to think about it. <laughs> that's uh, that's a great compliment, though. Uh, the the punkness of the book, like that's uh, <laughs> that's one of the best ones. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, well, I guess my last question is sort of a simple one, but maybe a complicated answer. Um, how did you know you were done with the book? Mm -hmm. Wow, I don't know. That was, that, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> aside from like my, uh, my editor being like, you're done. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I, uh, um, because I wanted to keep going, you know, I wanted, uh, there, 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 there's so much that I wanted to put, put in here. Um, but I knew how, uh, um, I had the end, I actually had the ending in mind, uh, almost like from the beginning, which was, you know, my, um, my mom and I, uh, singing in the car, like singing her favorite her favorite song, uh, Japanese song together and me fumbling over the words and her, uh, and, he and hearing her sing, uh, because that was, you know, the, the, it was the first moment of the, of the turn, you know, um, the, uh, for, for me, just when, not necessarily when healing began, but when I started to notice the healing, because the healing had started before that. Uh, but that's when I was like, oh, like um, my mom and I can just like be in a car together, and then <laughs> and and and, it, and it's like and it feels good. It's just uh, it's comfortable, and um, and that also I'm she's singing like I'm hearing her, you know, I'm letting her um, 
I'm letting her speak and sing and not, there's no judgment or anything. And, and actually I'm the one who's fumbling. So I, I knew I wanted to end with that moment, uh, but like, how do I, right? Like, what do I fill in to get us there? And, um, uh, and I don't know, I guess I just, I think at some point I just felt scraped out. You know, I felt like it, it was, uh, um, I can't, at least for right now, like, cause even still now, like I have all, uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh no, I should have said that. I should have said that. And there's this, I should have added. Uh, but I think it, at the mo- at the time when it was the, you know, the, de- the deadline helps, but I just, just like, this is, I can't, I can't do any more to this. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I've said everything that needs to be said for like, for this story. I think, I think sometimes you just know. Yeah. Yeah. The gut mm-hmm. For sure. I think, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, with the first project, the first big project, it's like you want to put everything. In the <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like make it, make it count. Make it, yeah. Um, but yeah, then, you know, uh, yeah. Unfortunately we can't, uh, say everything in one book. <laughs> guess that's why there's so many out there (laughs) yeah it was a beautiful note to end on um yeah and yeah music just yeah music featured for me just in the rhythm of your book and also the moments where it was explicitly mentioned um thank you yeah um is is that it (laughs) yeah Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you to, to Elizabeth. Thank you to Allie. Uh, buy the book. The link is in the chat. Uh, I want to thank our funders here. I'm going to bring up their slide. Uh, thank you to our funders. Uh, you can uh, catch up with previous readings and see what's upcoming at our website, wab.org. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and uh, have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Bye.